Hi, everybody. This is Renelle Delmont. I'm the publisher of a website that you've heard of called the Lindbergh Kidnapping Hoax.com. And I based my website on a book with a similar name, Crime of the Century, the Lindbergh Kidnapping Hoax by Gregory Algren and Stephen Monier. The website was started in 1998, so it's 22 years already. Can't believe it, but I want to explain something about my website because I'm a, a lecturer and for 20 years here in South Florida, Palm Beach, Dade, and Broward counties, I've been giving uh, about 30 lectures every month for 20 years. And quite often, because this book was so astonishing to me about Lindbergh possibly the killer of his own child, in Algren and Monier's book, It Was an Accident, which he covered up. But I'm here to explain something that I think at the moment is extremely important for everyone to understand. Uh, and I'm gonna just tell you what happened to me because I wish I had a nickel for every person over 20 years who's asked me, Ronell, why Lindbergh? What, what is the thing that you have about Lindbergh? Why are you so interested in it? There's so many other things that you could write books about, so many other topics that you could have a website about. Of course, I've never gotten the chance to explain this, so I'm going to tell you here and now. Here I was at nine years old something like eight or nine, I was, Lower East Side, New York. When I was this age, I was ve we were a very poor family in a tenement walk up on the East Third between Avenues B and C. <laughs> you have to be a millionaire to live there today, but we were quite poor. We didn't have any money for books and things, so I read newspapers. I could read at the age of four and five, and that's what we did. I didn't have, I don't remember any toys. We read newspapers. I did what the grown-ups did. And when I was that age in that picture, I had something happen to me that I never forgot. And that was in the tabloids, like the Daily News at the time, and there were lots of newspapers. There were pictures of two little boys. They were my age. Well, one of them was exactly my age. And they lived near me. Well, everybody on the Lower East Side lived near each other. It was like a shtetl. If you were Jewish, you knew every everybody. Um, of course, it's not only Jews that lived there. But these two little boys were in the newspapers every single day for a time. 1954, 1953, I was nine years old. I was born in 44. And these two little boys had parents who were going to be put in the electric chair. So you know who I'm talking about. Their names are Robert and Michael Mirapol today, but they were Michael and Robert um, Rosenberg. Well, Michael and Robert Rosenberg the two little boys, for some reason, were going to lose their parents. The government in the country that I was raised to worship, we, we worshipped America. All of my family came from pogroms in Eastern Europe. They uh, talked about the misery that they left behind and how wonderful America is. Whatever America did, it was perfect. They didn't even care that they were poor because they were in America, the Golden of Medina, the Golden Land, the Naya Medina. So I had a choice. When I was this age, here I am again, I love to look at this picture. <laughs> I was nine years old. I had a choice. I could say that whatever these two people who looked like they belonged to my family, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg looked just like anybody in my own family. They lived a few blocks away in Knickerbocker Village. Their children looked like they were my cousins. And the government that I love and the country that I was taught to worship was going to kill their parents. I never, I can't forget 
those um, memories because it was too shocking for me to handle at the age of nine. I was too young to handle it at nine and I'm 76 and I'm too old to handle it now. And this is how I uh, got involved in the uh, Lindbergh trial, uh, the Hauptmann trial and the Lindbergh case because over the years, what I did when I was nine was to decide, I had to make a decision, either my government was wrong or, or those two people that look so nice in the photographs parents, Julius and Ethel, they did something so horrific that the government was not going to allow them to raise their two boys. They'd have to go and die. And that's exactly what happened. And what happened to me is I had to cho choose. Is it my government that's doing something wrong or those two people are monsters? I had to choose my government and my country. I had no choice. It couldn't be otherwise. And for my whole life, pretty much, I decided that, that I didn't really decide. I can't deal with the death penalty. And uh, they are the only uh, spies ever executed. And they had two little boys who are now my age, of course. And one day, uh, I think it was 2003, I got to meet Robbie Mirapol. I met him here in Florida when he came down to give a speech in Deerfield Beach to an organization about his parents. And Robert Mirapol and I were together the whole weekend that he was visiting with two women uh, that I knew and they invited me. They heard me give a lecture on this book of all Ammonias and they came up to me. They were both from Trenton, New Jersey. They owned the beauty salon. I'll never forget those two women because they stood on the corner of Broward Boulevard with signs every night against the Iraq invasion. And anyway, they invited me to their house to meet Robert Mirapol, and I asked him every question I could think of for the entire two days that I had that chance. And what he told me was so shocking, so shocking. He told me, and I've asked people this question in every audience, when I talk about Rosenberg case or the Hauptmann case, does anybody really know what Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were put on trial for? Well, I get the answers that you're probably thinking of, which is, oh yes, they gave the atomic bomb secret to Stalin, or they were atomic spies and they were spies for Russia. No, <laughs> those answers are all wrong. They were put on trial under the Espionage Act for conspiring to spy, conspiracy to spy. There wasn't a government physicist there at that trial to explain what it was they gave Stalin or the, the Soviets or the communists, because it was a big farce. The entire trial that went on in 1951, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm just trying to explain something very, very important to my audience, and the people who read my website or people who are interested in the Lindbergh case and Hauptmann's trial, because something is happening right now that is so important and the news media has banned it from the airwaves. I don't know where it is. It has to do with this guy. I'm afraid to say his name. They might take down my website or this video because that's exactly what's happening. Anybody who puts up anything about Julian Assange's trial that's going on right now in London uh, seems to have the algorithms switched around so that uh, it's difficult for people to find uh, their website. And that's why I'm talking to everybody right now because I'm afraid for my website, I'm afraid for my YouTube channel. Um, afraid because the algorithms, if you don't know what that is, look it up. I don't know how to explain it to you. I'm just trying to explain my involvement in the Hauptmann trial had to do with, at the time that I met Robert Mirapol, it was just as, it, it coincided with this book, which told me that everything I knew about Lindbergh and everything I had known from childhood, because 
my father told me everything about Lindbergh and the trial and the, my father was wrong. He was wrong. And Algren and Monier have set the thinking on the right track by writing this groundbreaking book. And at the same time I read it, I met Robert Mirapol, who answered every question I could think of, including the fact that I was never aware, and most people, I'm telling you, because I do a lot of lectures on the Rosenbergs over 20 years here and there in Florida, I've done it many, many times, and nobody gets the answer correct. Nobody. Nobody ever, when I ask, what were the Rosenbergs executed for? What were they put on trial for? Nobody knows the answer. And the answer was conspiracy to spy. They were not spies exactly. They weren't put on trial for, for they were put on trial because the government didn't have a case. They didn't have a case. They didn't have a physicist who could come and say that this uh, drawing on the jello box was accurate or not. That, they never gave the bond to Stalin. The man who actually did that was Klaus Fuchs, who was sent to Los Alamos by the British. He was a physicist. And you know what? You know what happened to Klaus Fuchs? He confessed that he had given the secrets of atomic energy to Stalin. In 1949, the Soviets detonated a bomb. You know what happened to Klaus Fuchs? He went to the electric chair. They hung him. No. He went to jail. I think he spent 10 years in prison, traded uh, for a spy. The Russians and the British traded spies. And Klaus Fuchs died of natural causes, probably in a clean bed with his loved ones holding his hand or whatever. And the Rosenbergs were electrocuted. They were the only ones ever to have that happen to them. And right now, so this is very important for people who are interested in my website or any website that deals with criticism of our government, the British government, whatever government, because I'm try, I want to make sure that I'm explaining this correctly because it is complicated. Um, but let me bring up this other thing. When I was a little girl in public school, uh, we were taught about a guy named William Cosby, not, not the one that raped girls, that's Bill Cosby, but there was another Cosby named William. And that was in something like 1753. We weren't even the United States at that time. This William Cosby became the governor of New Amsterdam or whatever we were called, the colonies. And he was very corrupt, very, <laughs> he did a lot of, interesting shady things and the people in New York at the time they wrote about it they wrote letters to the editor about the new governor and of course you've probably never heard of this guy I, I'm so old I know the name like it's <laughs> uh, his name was John Peter Zenger Z-E-N-G-E-R his newspaper that he published, the New, the, the New York Daily or the New York Evening News, whatever he called it, it was like one or two sheets of uh, paper. He published all of these angry letters to the editor and angry stories uh, about the new governor who was taking bribes and not behaving properly. And Peter Zenger published them. And for that, Peter Zenger was thrown into a dungeon. His wife and his children ran the newspaper while he was in prison. I think he was in jail for a year. And they burned his newspapers in broad daylight in front of City Hall. Peter Zenger, don't forget the name. Do a Google search, do a Schmoogle search. I don't care what search you do. You're going to find out why Julian Assange is so important right now to all of us, every single person. Uh, they've got him in a glass cage, a glass booth. It's like a Tic Tac box or something, I don't know, a refrigerator. When did you ever hear of a prisoner in a glass booth? 
If you're old enough like me, you might remember a guy named Adolf Eichmann. He killed millions and millions of people and the Israelis put him in a glass booth on his, at his trial to protect him from being slaughtered by the angry Holocaust survivors. But Julian Assange killed who? The truth? Nobody. The NSA, the CIA, the FBI, your government, my government, they can't come up with one person who's, who was killed or harmed because of WikiLeaks. And oh, yes, in case I didn't mention, uh, Julian Assange is the founder of WikiLeaks, and you should go there and read it. You should see what he's being put on trial for, telling the truth, which is why I mentioned Peter Zenger. There's a book, uh, where did I put it? Indelible Link. There's one you could read. Richard Kluger, Indelible Link. It'll tell you all about the first Bill Cosby, <laughs> the, the, William Cosby, and what happened at this trial of Peter Zenger. That's what we learned in kindergarten, along with the cherry tree that Washington chopped down and the log cabin that, that uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, none of which was true. <laughs> but this is true. John Peter Zenger was freed. He was acquitted because of one reason. And it's the foundation of freedom of the press in our country. It's the whole foundation for why I can have a website about Richard Hauptman's trial. Yes freedom of the press. The, the, the journalists are the only profession even listed in the Bill of Rights or the Constitution. There's no other profession. They talk about handlestick makers and shoemaker. No, freedom of the press. And it comes from Peter Zenger. That was the basis for it. Why? Here's the reason. Because what was being said about William Cosby in 1753 turned out to be true. John Peter Zenger was publishing the attacks, the criticisms of the governor, Cosby. He was publishing them on behalf of other people who knew the secrets of the corruption of the governor. And it's all turned out to be true. And that is the basis of our country. So I know this is going to sound hyperbolic or woo woo crazy and conspiracy oriented, but I know I'm right. If Julian Assange is going to be extradited to the United States from Old Bailey, where his trial in a glass booth and where he's in the back of the courtroom. He's not in the front in a glass booth. He's in the back. No one can hear him. He has not seen his lawyers and had a conference with them for something like six months. Uh, the judge has given his, uh, his uh, witnesses, the defense witnesses, 30 minutes to tell, to be interrogated in this trial. And the prosecution has all the time in the world. It's the most unfair kangaroo a court you've ever heard about. It's not to be believed. It's like Alice in Wonderland. I follow it daily on um, Consortium News, Joe Loria, and there are other people. Daniel Ellsberg, if you remember that name, if you're old enough. Daniel Ellsberg is one of the witnesses for the defense. Uh, you can Google all of this uh, and you'll understand why I'm upset and why I'm angry and why I told you about the Rosenbergs. Why am I talking about Hauptmann? Because this is very important to me. I grew up in a family that worshiped this country and I had to make a choice when I was a kid. I couldn't believe that anything was wrong with my country. I couldn't imagine criticizing it. And here I am criticizing for on my website the government of New Jersey for what I believe was, um, what can you call it? I'm afraid to say, the algorithms might get me. Here's another guy, he's hiding in Russia. He didn't go to Russia. The New York Times, The Guardian, the you name all those big newspapers, every time they write about him, they always put in, he, he fled to Russia. No. Snowden didn't fl flee to Russia. He was fleeing to Ecuador where they would give him asylum from Hong Kong. But Eric Holder and the President Obama 
uh, revoked his passport and visa as he landed in Sheremetyevo Airport in Moscow in order to change planes so he could get to Ecuador. In other words, they stranded him in Moscow, made it look like he was a Russian spy. Putin took a while to decide. 40 days he spent in the airport without a passport or a visa until uh, Vladimir Putin finally decided to give him asylum and then gave him more asylum as the years went on. So neither Snowden or Assange are spies for Russia or China. They're spies for you and me. <laughs> what these two people did is to tell you and me the truth by leaking the truth of our intelligence agencies that were hiding the truth from us. And if truth is not what America is, then we're not living in America anymore. We're living in what I grew up as the KGB Soviet Union, where I grew up thinking that they were monsters over there. You had to whisper in your own house. You had to whisper because the KGB had bugs everywhere. Well, now, what do you think we're living in? They're spying on us all of this video. Every phone call you make, every, every time you're with your cell phone, these are opportunities to be listened to by your government. So this guy is a, an American, Snowden. You should watch Oliver Stone's movie. It's very good. Read his book, Permanent Record. I don't know what to tell you to do. I don't want to make this a, a long mishigas here. I don't want to make it a long uh, so that you'll get bored or uninterested. But Julian Assange, born in Australia. He's not even an American citizen. And our government wants to get their hands on him, put him in jail for 175 years for the, uh, he, he'll be prosecuted, on, he's being prosecuted under the Espionage Act, which is for spying. But the, the Rosenbergs were put on trial for the Espionage Act, but the charge against them was conspiracy to spy because the government had no evidence, yet they went to their deaths anyway. Even if Rosen, uh, Julius had been a spy, his wife never was. And it's Roy Cohn, who I think by now you've all heard of. There are two recent documentaries made about him. Uh, Roy Cohn told Judge Kaufman, the judge called the prosecutor to ask, what should I do with Ethel? And Roy Cohn told him to put her in the electric chair before he died of AIDS. Roy Cohn uh, told a reporter, it's, I forgot who it was he told this to, that he himself would have pulled the switch on Ethel had he had the chance to do it. Well, now that you're all confused, I, I just want you to understand one thing. If Julian Assange is found to be extradited, the trial in Old Bailey right now, it's been going on for weeks. If the, if the judge decides to extradite him to the United States, He'll be in jail. The charges add up to 175 years. And what was his crime? Exposing crime. The same thing that Ed Snowden did, exposing crime. Neither of them have lied about a single issue. Not a single report that they released, either of these two men, have ever been contested by anybody. It's absolute truth. That's why I told you to read Indelible Link by Richard Kluger so that you'll get the understanding that what we're, we're American only for one reason. There's only one reason we're Americans, and that's because of a piece of paper called the Constitution. The French people have a different piece of paper. The British have a different. The Constitution defines our country, how we live in a daily basis, and what our rights are. Well, take your pick. I, I chose when I was nine not to believe that my country could be wrong. I couldn't criticize anything about my, my wonderful country. And let's hope it's still wonderful. And 
I'm worried about my website. Uh, the New York Times has to be worried about them themselves, The Guardian, and you don't hear a peep from them. Julian Assange and Ed Snowden make, made those uh, newspapers filthy rich with all of their leaks. They published everything, every, and then they stopped. And now you, it's crickets. You don't hear a, a word from them on behalf of freedom of the press. You don't hear anything. They're busy talking about idiocy on the news. I don't watch it. I get my news from independent sources all over the YouTube channel. And uh, maybe I'll put a list of some of them there. <laughs> good night and good luck.